So I hear search warrants are pretty popular topics of conversation lately. So let's talk about them. What are search warrants and how do they work? But before that, if you like this type of content and you find value in it, please like and subscribe and share with your friends. Help me beat the YouTube algorithm. Welcome to the law and life. My name is Patrick McGinn and I am your best friend at your worst time. So search warrants are in the news a lot lately. And I got a lot of questions about, you know, what is a search warrant? How do they work? Well, there's basically three parts to the search warrant. There's the search warrant itself. There's the application or affidavit in support of the search warrant. And there's an inventory in return with the warrant. So what does that mean? And where do search warrants come from in the first place? A search warrant is a requirement of the Fourth Amendment. And the Fourth Amendment says, The right of the people to be secure in their person, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable search and seizure shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched in the persons or things to be seized. So we could see from that it's clear what the requirements for a search warrant are, and you must have a warrant if you're going to search for something. That's a prerequisite to the search. And the reason we have a Fourth Amendment is during British occupation, British soldiers and British authorities would just come into your house and do whatever they want and search for whatever they want. So our founding fathers, in their infinite wisdom, developed the Fourth Amendment to protect us against those types of searches. So because you have an expectation of privacy against governmental intrusion, the Fourth Amendment requires search warrants signed by a judge or a magistrate as a protection for, for the people against unreasonable searches and seizures. So in the realm of the whole search warrant auspice, you have the warrant itself, which is a few pages that's signed by the judge or magistrate, and it gives information and authority to search. It's supported by oath and affirmation as required in, in the constitutional amendment, an affidavit or application for the search warrant. All right, there's several search warrant requirements. One is probable cause. The law enforcement must have probable cause to believe that what they are searching for is at the location they want to search. The search warrant has to be particular. It has to describe what is being searched, like a house, a car, a building, or whatever. The search warrant must be signed by a neutral and detached magistrate. So the judge can't be involved in the investigation and the application for the search warrant. He must be total, he or she must be totally detached from it. So when can the government execute a search warrant? Well, Federal Rule Procedure 41 requires that a search warrant, unless there's some other circumstances involved, special circumstances, a search warrant is not to be executed at night and it should be executed between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. Now, under state cases, Different states have different rules for the execution of search warrants. So let me get into this whole search warrant thing and how you get a search warrant. As a homicide detective, I've written a bunch of search warrants. And it starts not with the search warrant, but with the affidavit or application in support of the search warrant. So that is where you describe your probable cause. And it starts out. I sit down and I type it out. My name is Patrick McGeehan. I am a police officer, detective, whatever, with such and such an agency. I have been in this capacity for X number of years. I am currently assigned, let's say the narcotics division. I'm currently assigned to the narcotics division. On such and such a date, I went to, or I sent an informant, or one of our undercover officers went to a location of a house at whatever address, the house is blue with yellow trim, whatever, describe the house. I knocked on the door, the informant knocked on the door and purchased from a white male and you describe the white male. And you purchased for, you know, X number of dollars, you know, you got in return so much narcotic and you left. And then maybe you went back another day and another detective or somebody else went back and did it again. That is all your probable cause. And then you could say, you know, if you investigate further, you find out that the white male is the same white male that answers the door every time on such and such a day. You observe people driving up to the car, the same white male open the door. You observe the hand-to-hand -hand exchange. 
and you further investigated the owners, the leases of the house, or you ran the tags and you got the driver's license photos or whatever, and you identified the white male as Joe Smith living at that address. And uh, you did other investigations, whatever other investigations you did that led you to identify, you know, what's to be searched, who are the occupants there, and where you need to search. So you get all that information, you put it in your affidavit and support, you sign it in front of the judge, and you take your search warrant. Now your search warrant, your, your affidavit or your application for search warrant or your affidavit and support is going to be a lot of pages because it describes a lot of stuff. And then your search warrant, you describe the place you want to search. You put the address. What we used to do, because at the time, there was a lot of cases where officers were executing search warrants at the wrong house, the wrong address. So we would put the address. We would put a description of the house. You know, it's got a completely fenced yard. It's two acres. It's one acre. Um, you know, it's a blue house with yellow trim, whatever. It's got an oak tree in the front yard. And to get to it, we would leave the homicide office. We would take this route. We would turn down this street. That subject house at address, whatever, whatever, is the second house on the left after turning here or there. And you describe how to get to the house to avoid the problem of hitting the wrong house. You also describe, you know, you, you want to search inside the house and you want to search for narcotics. So you're going to describe the house. You're going to describe what kind of narcotic or any narcotic you want to search for is in that house. And you're going to want to go in at whatever time, you know, whatever time the, the state jurisdiction or whatever the jurisdiction the warrant's going to be executed in, whatever time you are able to. Now, there's all kinds of other aspects you can put on there that, that play a role in it, such as exigent circumstances, no-knock warrants. There's a bunch of exceptions to search warrants when you don't need a search warrant to search certain things but that's a whole new video a whole nother video and we can get into that if you want if you have any questions about exception to search warrants just let me know so you do the search warrant you do the application or the affidavit in support of the search warrant and you go to the judge if it's the middle of the night it's exigent circumstances you need it done right away they have on-call judges you go to the judge's house, you show him the search warrant, he reads the application, he swears you in, and you sign it. So now you have your search warrant. You go there, you go to the house, it's been described in the search warrant, you hit the house, you search, You could search anywhere in the house where narcotics can be hidden. So if you know, it's, you're know you looking for small baggies of narcotics, they could be hidden almost anywhere, so you can search almost anywhere. But if your search warrant says, you know, you're going to the house to search for a safe, you can only search where safes would be located. For example, you can't look through a dresser drawer for a safe that's four foot tall and three foot wide. Or let's say you're searching for a diamond ring. Now you can look in dresser drawers because you can put a diamond ring in dresser drawers. But let's say you're searching for a car. Well, yeah, you can go in the house and you can search in the garage or any place a car could be kept, but you can't search through dresser drawers with for cars. And that's you're limited in the scope of the search warrant. So you go in, you hit the house, you search the house, you get all what you're looking for, all the narcotic, anything you see that is in plain view, say there's a bunch of cash and a bunch of weapons there, anything that is in plain view, you could seize that contraband under the plain view doctrine, which is an exception to a search warrant. And we can get into that too later. Anyway, so you hit your search warrant, you make your arrest, you do whatever you do, you impound all your property, and you take it all back to the police station and put it in property and evidence. And then you do a return and in inventory on the search warrant. You list everything that you seized in an inventory sheet, you attach it to the search warrant and the affidavit, and then you go file that with the clerk of the office, the clerk of the courts. And that is basically how a, how a search warrant works in real life from having done a lot of them. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. I always try to read the comments. Also, I read emails and take questions that way. If you have anything that you would like further explanation on or further discussion of, please let me know. Remember, always like and subscribe and help me beat the YouTube algorithm and get out there to more people if you find this information relevant and useful. Thanks and have a great day and I'll see you next time on The Law and Life.